Once upon a time. Once upon a time. Once upon a time. Once upon a time. There was a princess. Once upon a time. Once upon a time. There was a girl assigned to be an assassin. Once upon a time. 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 That's how these stories begin, isn't it? Stories told in quiet moments, difficult times passed from mother to child, grandmother to grandchildren, in order to entertain or pass the time. My name is Christington, and I'm here to tell you some stories about some stories. The fairy tales of old weren't necessarily instructional. Back then, the thought of sermonizing through story fell to the wayside in favor of a good tale or a good scare. People were just trying to keep themselves entertained. There was little to no subtext in these stories. And of these stories, few have had such a resonant and long-lasting message as that of Little Red Riding Hood. It might surprise some of you that the oldest versions of Little Red Riding Hood have no savior woodsman come to rescue Red and Granny at the end. Oftentimes, neither one of them would survive. It all depends on the storyteller. No, the oldest version I know that's been recorded, to let the old wives tell it, goes a little something like this. There lived a girl in a village who was sent to her grandmother's house by her mother to deliver a basket of goodies. As she walked through the forest, she met a wolf. Good day, said the wolf. Good day, said the girl. Where are you running off to so early this morning? The young girl did not know the nature of wolves, and so told him she was off to her grandmother's house. They bid their goodbyes, and the girl continued down the path and on her way. The wolf, knowing the woods well, sped off with haste to find grandmother's house first. Hello, came the weak voice of Grandmother upon his entering. She heard nothing but a growl as he closed the door behind him and tore his teeth into her flesh. He drained the blood, but for one glass, 
and ate the flesh, but for one plate's worth. With these, he set a plate and a glass on the table, put upon grandmother's nightshirt, and then climbed into her bed. The little girl arrived shortly after and knocked at grandmother's door. Do, do come in, dear, said the wolf. The girl entered. The light was so dark, she could not see her grandmother clearly. You must be so tired from your long journey. Do have some of the meat on the table. And the girl stepped forward and ate her grandmother's flesh. You must be thirsty after all that walking. Please have some of the wine as well. And the girl lifted the glass and drank her grandmother's blood. You must be exhausted from your long walk to the woods. Do come to bed with me. And so the girl climbed into bed with the wolf. So close she was able to see that it was not her grandmother and was, in fact, the wolf. Fright jolted through her, and she knew that she must flee. I have to go to the privy. Oh, you can do that here in bed. I I do sometimes, said the wicked, wicked wolf, licking his lips. I don't have to go little. I have to go big. Very well. But hurry back the moment you're done. And so the girl ran and ran and ran. She ran past the privy through the woods and did not stop until she was safely back at home. And that's it. As you heard, there's no woodsman in this version. And it's a much darker retelling than we hear of today. This is an Italian version known as La Finta Nonna, the false grandmother. As far as I know, this dates back to the 10th century. If we were to extrapolate any fault from the girl in this story, it's that she's too naive, which is only to be expected of a child. There's little lesson to be had from this except that bad things can happen to trusting people. It's just evidence of the world that they lived in. In another version, this one French, there's a cat who appears to the girl and accuses her of being a slut for drinking the blood and eating the flesh of her grandmother. The wolf also has the girl strip away her clothes and throw them into the fire before getting into bed with him. She doesn't get away in that version. And once again, there's no hunter to save the day. Much of the same lack of lesson is in that version. It's just evidence of the harshness of the life that they lived. I first discovered this version, this really harsh French peasant version, in a book called The Great Cat Massacre. This is my first true discovery of how fairy tales once were, because I did, I grew up with the Disney versions, you know, where everything works out in the end. There's little evidence of reality in a lot of the fairy tales that we know now of today. And this book was so integral to sort of this rabbit hole I went into of discovering folk tales. This book is used to set the mindsets of the French peasants in the 18th century. It's the kind of tale they'd hear sat around a fire, the kind that they would relax to. I mean, life was tough for a French peasant. I guess it's it's the French peasant equivalent of watching a horror movie, or, as many of you do, listening to serial killer podcasts. <laughs> anyway, Robert Darton, the author of The Great Cat Massacre, brings up several points in his book that we're exploring in this podcast. Folktales are historical documents, he says. They have evolved over many centuries and have taken different turns in different cultural traditions. They suggest that mentalité themselves have changed. We can appreciate the distance between our mental world and that of our ancestors if we imagine lulling a child of our own to sleep with the primitive peasant version of Little Red Riding Hood. And that's the end of the quote. Little Red Riding Hood, La Finta Nona, whatever we call it, is one of the most telling insights into that ever-changing mentalité. Even within the 18th century French society, the stories peasants told and the stories the sheltered nobility told would be so different. Peasant life wasn't easy in any country. There was an unbridled harshness to it, not only in the backbreaking labor required of the day, but in the losses they endured as well. The death rate for children at the time was 
huge. It's beyond imagining to our modern society with all of our medicines, clean hospitals, and general education. It's something so far beyond our scope that we have people who don't believe vaccines work because they've never seen what it's like to be in a world where most of the population is not vaccinated. People used to die often from measles and chickenpox and things that we have easy cures for, if only people take all their vaccines. We can take a look at the Charles Perrault version, Les Petits Chaperons Rouges, for contrast. His is dated to 1697, and my translation comes from Andrew Lang's Blue Fairy Book of 1888. It exemplifies the juxtaposition between those fireside peasant stories and what would be deemed appropriate enough to put in a book, which meant printing and all this, that in the age of self-publishing, I don't think we understand the gravitas of what it takes to get something published. Anyway, the goriness of Red eating her grandmother's flesh and drinking her blood is removed from this version. He does give the scene more details, and he adds to the tension. Red still gets into bed with the wolf in this one, and the scene is drawn out in a way any one of us could recognize. Grandmother! What big arms you have! Uh, oh, all the better to hug you with, my dear. Grandmother, what big legs you have! All the better to run with, my dear. Grandmother, what big ears you have. All the better to hear with, my child. Grandmother, what big eyes you have. All the better to see you with, my dear. Grandmother, what big teeth you've got. All the better to eat you up with. And saying those words, the wicked wolf fell upon Little Red Riding Hood and ate her all up. And after all of that, we have, for, well, one of the first times, honestly, a moral. One of those pesky, plainly stated morals ensuring no child could walk away from this tale without a lesson. Except Perot doesn't do quite that. He isn't necessarily writing for children. He's writing for nobility, probably, you know, those nice, respectable young ladies in the nobility, and he's a little tongue-in-cheek about it. So the moral goes as such. Children, especially attractive, well-bred young ladies, should never talk to strangers. For if they should do so, they may well provide dinner for a wolf. I say wolf, but there are various kinds of wolves. There are also those who are charming, quiet, polite, unassuming, complacent, and sweet, who pursue young women at home and in the streets. And unfortunately, it is these gentle wolves who are the most dangerous ones of all. This is most certainly a moral for attractive, well-bred young ladies. And attractive, well-bred young ladies would not ever be found in those campfire retellings. Never. I told you. These stories aren't for kids. Pro's version undoubtedly left a mark on this story, though. Without Pro, we wouldn't know the girl by her head covering. And that head covering tells us a lot about her at the time it was written. We don't think about the expense dyes once were nowadays, because synthetic production brings us any color we can imagine, not to mention the proximity of everything. We have airplanes and boats and things. I mean, we have Amazon. <laughs> but. In 17th century France, the color red was still carmine, manufactured from a little Mexican cactus beetle called cochineal. Yes, I said a Mexican beetle. Think about getting that little Mexican beetle to France and grounding it up and getting a bunch of them so you have enough to die with. That costs you a pretty penny. We do still actually use cochineal. You can nowadays find it as natural red 4 or E120. Anyway, in other versions, Red's hood is in fact gold, which I think further demonstrates how dear the hood is meant to be. But to us nowadays, we stick to the red because it means more to us, more than it did back then even, I think. Red to our modern sensibilities is very easy to connect to an idea of a loose woman or love or lust. It's easier to think of a young girl being taken advantage of if we think she deserved it or wanted it. For feminist retellings, the color red is an important symbol of menstruation. Every bit a coming of age is the story itself. When red is written as older in these, she's often presented as a sexual creature, grappling with her own desire-filled instincts. Nothing tips us off to a woman empowered by her own sexuality better than a pair of red-lined lips. But back again to what once was. 
Many of us grew up thinking of the Brothers Grimm as the standard for fairy tales. To their credit, they did a wonderful job of collecting folk tales, with many of their stories coming from women in their own country. Their version of Little Red Riding Hood was provided by Jeanette Hassenflug and Marie Hassenflug. You might have noticed Jeanette and Marie aren't particularly Germanic sounding names. That's because the Hassenflugs did have their roots in France, which also explains the influences from Perrault's retellings. Their heroine is called Little Red Cap, so named for a gift Red received from her grandmother. Like in Perrault's version, right off the bat they describe how close the two are, how grandmother dotes on Red enough that she was always giving the child gifts, until one day she gives her a velvet cap, to which the girl becomes so attached to she begins to be known by it. We have actually come to know the grim Hassenflug tale, with a Perrault title. Their recording of it lets us right into the mind of the wolf. As if we didn't know his intent, I know. As he speaks to himself quite early on, just after meeting Red in the woods. Now that sweet young thing is a tasty bite for me. She'll taste even better than the old woman. But you must be sly, and you can catch them both. But unlike the other versions, we have a moment of pause for Red. An inkling of hesitation. A gut reaction to a wrongness she can only feel and not identify yet. Oh my god, why am I so afraid? I usually like it at grandmother's, she says to herself after entering the cottage. I like to think that after years of telling this story, the woman telling it wanted Red to seem wiser. They wanted to relate to her. They too had strange inklings before they knew why. I mean, I know I did growing up. In this version, the wolf is wiser too. He doesn't speak at first, and Red goes to the bed to see grandmother lying there with her cap pulled down and looking very strange. It's only then we get our, why grandmother? back and forth. But unlike Perrault's version, this one cuts it down to the three lines we know best, eyes, ears, and teeth. The wolf eats Red in a single gulp and falls asleep, and sated from his double meal, then begins to snore loudly. Here we have our first huntsman, for whom the wolf is a long-standing adversary. He almost shoots the wolf until he thinks better of it and uses a pair of scissors to cut the belly open and free the grandmother. Red jumps out first, saying how frightened she was, and then puts rocks in the belly of the wolf when she and Granny are free. Then at the end, they each get their prize. The huntsman gets the pelt of the wolf, Granny gets the cake and butter Red brought, and Red herself comes out with this moral. As long as I live, I will never leave the path and run off into the woods by myself if Mother tells me not to. Isn't that interesting? How the moral changes to suit the needs of the storyteller? Perrault's moral was don't trust strangers. But the Brothers Grimm and the Hassenflug sisters tell us not to stray from the path. Which, if this is intended for a child, is certainly a lesson you want them to stick to. Murray Hassenflug's addendum goes as such, and I added it here because, again, it shows the way to me in which women sought to tell stories that empowered them. They tell how Little Red Cap was taking some baked things to Grandmother another time, when another wolf spoke to her and wanted her to stray from the path. But Red took care and went straight to Grandmother's. She told she had seen the wolf and that he wished her good day, but had stared at her in a wicked manner. If we hadn't been on a public road, he would have eaten me up. So Grandmother goes to lock the door and the wolf comes by and knocks, pretending once again to be a little red cat. Grayhead, the wolf, crept around the house several times and finally jumped onto the roof. He wanted to wait until little red cap went home that evening, then follow her and eat her up in the darkness. But the grandmother saw what he was up to. There was a large stone trough in front of the house. Fetch a bucket, little red cap. Yesterday I cooked some sausage. Carry the water that I boiled them with to the trough. Little red cap carried water until the large, large trough was clear full. The smell of sausage arose into the wolf's nose. He sniffed and looked down, stretching his neck so long that he could no longer hold himself, and he began to slide. He slid off the roof, fell into the trough, and drowned. And Little Red Cap returned home happily, and no one harmed her. <laughs> I love that Marie wrote her own little sequel. 
You see how Red learns from that first interaction where she didn't listen to her instincts, but this time she does and how well that suits her. Let the Old Wives Tell It is brought to you by Analogy Audio. For more information on what we're about, go to analogyaudio.com and stay tuned after the musical break. update the story within modern retellings, we do get a few consistent variations. Much like some of those thousand-year-old stories, many of our versions delight in giving Red a chance to escape. In Sondheim's musical Into the Woods, Red starts out selfish, gluttonous, and trusting. The baker saves the duo and cuts open the wolf. This is how it relates to the Grimm version, which I'm pretty sure is where Sondheim got his source material. But after this encounter, Red runs around in a wolf pelt and both she and Granny are pretty able to defend themselves. In these modern updates, often Red becomes a wolf herself, as you can find within Angela Carter's The Company of Wolves, or the ABC series Once Upon a Time. You could also make a case that Scott McCall in Teen Wolf is Little Red Riding Hood as well, since he initially gets attacked wearing a red hoodie. Like with Angela Carter's story, many modern retellings use this as a parable to explore female sexuality. Red is given just that much more agency in these versions. It takes the erotic overtones of the Charles Perrault version and usually alters them so we can focus on Red both embracing and learning to be cautious about her own sexuality. Another thing that modern versions have in common is parallels to the internet. After all, it is the modern dark foreboding woods where strangers lurk ready to trick us. Jess Watson Miller on the body painting competition show Skin Wars actually created one of my favorite interpretations of Red Riding Hood in the age of the internet. Uh, I suggest you Google it if you got a chance to, if you haven't seen it. Anyway, it's so easy to catfish people, so easy to convince people that you're something you're not, and to build up a rapport and high level of trust with people on the internet. 
One of my favorite oppositions to this idea of Red as the victim in this sort of situation is the 2005 movie Hard Candy. In it, Ellen Page plays a 14-year-old girl who flirts with the wolfish character. In this version, he's a 32-year-old decently attractive photographer who's also definitely a pedophile rapist and murderer. He's played really well by Patrick Wilson. But she doesn't flirt with him because she's trying to seduce him or anything like that. These flirtations are only a stepping stone to tying him up, torturing him, making him admit he's a pedophile, and then driving him to suicide under the promise of erasing the evidence of his crimes if he does so. And, of course, releasing them if he doesn't. Retelling these stories to make them more relatable to us is so important to our society, I think. We can empower the victim, we can destroy the villain, we can marry them off, we can tell a moral, or illustrate any idea that we like. But to me, when I tell these stories, I always want to understand the reason behind why people in fairy tales make such odd decisions. You know, it, they always seem so naive. Things seem so strangely considered. I don't really buy the naivete of some of these stories, you know? Maybe because when I was eight years old, I stopped wearing shorts all the time because I knew how men could look at me. I don't know if it's through my obsessive reading habits or my mother's slight paranoia or my father's unbridled wolfish habits of his own that did it, but what was always so hard for me to believe in fairy tales was complete innocence. So, in my attempt to understand that, here's my version from Rudd's perspective. Mama always warned me about strangers. I never took her seriously. The town I grew up in was full of people who knew each other's names. When tradesmen came to share their wares, news traveled almost instantaneously of any little thing they said. In short, I didn't take her seriously because strangers didn't exist in my world. Mama always hated when the tradesmen came to town. She said I was distractible enough on a normal day, and that I was just about impossible when they came with all their wares and trinkets. <sighs> when I was just a few years younger, a dressmaker came to town with the most gorgeous fabrics and the finest cuts of cloth. I couldn't look away any time I passed through the square, especially once I saw the cloak. Oh, reader, if only you could have seen it. I'd never seen a color quite so robust, so vivid. The cut was plain, but that made the vibrancy of the red stand out that much more. The dressmaker David saw how I longed for it each day, and he insisted I try it on. It was perfect. From that moment on, I had a singular drive to possess it. Mama always fed me to my heart's content. I never wanted for anything, but I was so sure she wouldn't allow the cloak. There were too many other necessities to buy first, things I heard her grumbling about when she thought I couldn't hear. But there was always ample food. And so, for the first time in my life, I took advantage of her kindness. I'd secret away bread, muffins, and pastries, and still have plenty to fill myself with. I took the stolen bread and waited outside the bakery, offering cheaper prices for my own sweets. The baker shooed me off shortly into that endeavor, and I took to hawking through the streets instead until I'd earned enough to buy the cloak. David smiled and winked at me as we exchanged my newly made coin for his finery. I blushed when he told me how beautiful I looked in it. But then he paused, and he added, with a strange look in his eyes, Little girl, you're a woman now. I ran away when he said that, fueled by that awkward, sick feeling 
rising up in my stomach from hearing those words. I didn't know how I was going to tell Mama about it. I would have had to tell her about the bread and the muffins and the pastries first, and, and I was so afraid she'd be angry with me. I didn't know why I was so upset. I'm not afraid to be a woman. I wasn't afraid to be a woman. I was afraid of how he said it. Mama knew there was something wrong as soon as I got home. She was so sweet about it. I felt extra awful for lying to her. I had told myself there was nothing wrong with hiding the food or sneaking around as I was, but I finally admitted to myself what it was. A lie. So I pulled out my new cloak and showed it to her. Sweetie, it's beautiful. But where did you get it? She asked, taking the fabric in her hands and admiring the feel of it. David, the dressmaker, I choked out, trying to swallow down the tears that were suddenly threatening to escape. Oh, he didn't give it to you, did he? It's too fine a gift. Oh, tell him we'll pay for it. How much was it? I paid for it. You paid for it? I nodded. I don't understand. How? Her eyes were so open and inviting. Confused, but free of judgment. I... sold our food. <laughs> what? <laughs> she laughed. Her gorgeous, tinkling laughter. Well, I snuck away some of our bread and muffins and pastries, and I took them to the town square and sold them to people. You did all that without me noticing? Mama went quiet for a moment after, and then she mumbled. I thought you were growing, that your appetite was just getting bigger. I hadn't noticed till then, but I was barely breathing. My next breath was too big and... A tear threatened to escape. Oh, little one. I could have bought the cloak for you if you wanted it that much. All I do is try to provide for you. I could have sacrificed a thing or two for it. That was it. I couldn't take it anymore. How was she so nice to me after I lied to her like that? She watched me for a moment and then moved in closer. That's not what's wrong, though, is it? Is there something else? I... I don't know. When he gave me the cloak, he said I was more of a woman now. And the way he said it... It scared me, Mama. Oh, little one. She swept me tight into her arms. You shouldn't have to fear the thoughts of men. If you felt strange and uncomfortable by how he was speaking to you, I'm glad you listened to your instincts. Sometimes we get a sense about people, and it feels wrong and tight and scary. And sometimes we're right. Some men hold the scariest things in their minds. Why? I don't know why they do. Some men relish in taking without permission. You know how you took the food I gave you to eat and used it for your own purposes? I nodded, tearing up again as I thought of the wrong I had done her. And that's what separates you from them. And there are things that those men would take that neither of us want to lose. Things we could never get back if they did. Things that you would find it impossible to forgive them for. Those words haunted me. I know if I had asked, she would have explained more. But I also knew there were still things I didn't want to discover yet. As curious a child as I was. 
she swallowed me up in a tighter hug and told me that if I liked the cloak, I should wear it as often as I want. She insisted that I shouldn't let a man like David the dressmaker ruin it for me, and that wearing the cloak would take away the power my fear gave him. So I did. I wore it every day, as afraid as I was. I stayed especially close to her then. I was fully open and honest with her after that, and in time, I forgot the fear and wrongness that the dressmaker's words had brought upon me. I wore the cloak so often that eventually Mama no longer called me Little One, but instead, Little Red. The whole town joined in. And you know, I never once saw David the dressmaker again. I've often wondered if Mama had a hand in sending him away. For years, we would visit Grandmother together, Mama and I. It was a big to-do every month. We'd spend two whole days baking and cooking treats for her. As time passed, it came that we no longer visited to keep her company, but out of necessity. Her health declined so terribly that she had difficulty caring for herself. So our monthly visits turned weekly, and we would bring treats to last each time. Mama seemed particularly stressed between keeping both our house and Grandmother's house in order. She always gave people too much of herself. I asked her if she might have thought I'd grown enough to visit Grandmother by myself. I could hear the relief in her voice when she realized the burden that would be lifted from her. Red, I believe you are not so little now that you could not visit Mother all alone. She wrapped me up in a great big hug, and I think I saw a tear in her eye. However, we do not grow up all at once, my sweet. You are still, in many ways, a child. So you must promise me you will do exactly as I instruct. You still stray when we walk together, and I would not have you get lost when I cannot guide you back. I nodded eagerly feeling such an excitement fluttering in my belly for this chance to quest on my own. This is a great responsibility, Little Red, for if you stray, not only will I lose you, but your grandmother will be without food or friendship for the lack of you. Look me in the eyes and promise me that you will not stray. I promise. The next day, we packed all of Grandmother's treats, ourselves as full of excitement as we stuffed her basket. At the break of dawn, just as the sun had risen enough to glisten off the morning dew, I set off for Grandmother's house with an armful of Mama's love-filled hugs and another armful of Grandmother's get-well treats. The world was so much bigger without Mama to size it up against. I had walked the path to Grandmother's house for longer than I could remember, but walking it alone felt so new, so unsteady. I knew the trees and flowers so well, but the path itself I had never truly paid attention to before that day. Did the twisted tree with knots like a face truly meet us so early on the path? Or was the spring encircled by dandelions so close to the broken wagon wheel every time? My wonder at the path was interrupted by the sound of a snapped twig. Forgive me, Mama, but for only a moment I strayed from the path, hoping to find a curious deer or rabbit. But from behind a tree strolled out a wolf. His eyes were dark against his gray fur. He smiled at me, and his eyes were friendly. Wolves didn't bother our village much except for the occasional sheep. I was no sheep. Good day to you, little girl, said he. Good day, wolf, said I. 
Where is your mother, little girl? Asked he. She is at home, taking care of our family. And where are you off to that she's not taking care of you too? I was not afraid of the wolf, but I was reminded that I had a task. I felt nervous to be away from the path suddenly and resumed my walk. The wolf matched my pace and trotted along beside me just off the path. To my grandmother's house, I responded, trying very hard to stay focused. Hasn't she a husband or other family to care for her? No. So she's all alone except for your visit? Yes. How long did you say your visit was for? He inquired lazily, hopping over a set of brambles that blocked his path. It only takes one day, usually. But since Mama stayed home, I can stay with Grandmother a few days to help care for her, since her health is not what it was. It was nice, I had to say, to have a walk-in partner. But I couldn't help myself. I began to feel that safety and lack of focus as I did when I walked the path with Mama, straying a time or two to pick flowers, or chase a rabbit, or kick some stones. The wolf and I passed the time easily with talk. I'd tell him stories of our town, or even a few wilder ones Grandmother used to tell in better health. I sang him a song, one of Grandmother's favorites, of a husband and wife who refused to speak or else the loser would bar their door. A group of villains came and ransacked their house, ate their food, and still neither would speak. One of the knaves bends down to kiss the wife, and the man stands up and shouts at them for how dare they kiss his wife. The wife stood up victorious and called out that she won the bet and that he must bar the door. <laughs> the wolf laughed, but I didn't revel in the telling of the song as much as I usually did. The thought of some group of villains coming to steal from Grandmother entered my thoughts, and I realized the time I had wasted following the countless whimsies that rose along the path. I thanked the wolf for spending the walk with me and told him I must continue on my own. Uh, I know a shortcut you could take. Uh, I'd be happy to show you the way. It would make up for the time that we lost. He grinned, flashing his big teeth. I thanked him for the thought, but I had my mind made up to reset and concentrate on Mother's instructions, and informed him of such. He seemed somewhat disheartened to part ways with me, but as soon as he said his goodbye, he pranced away, surely in search of some poor farmer's sheep. Reinvigorated to see Grandmother, I picked up the pace and refused to look anywhere but the road. I half regretted not taking the wolf up on his offer of a shortcut, but I had no idea that he wouldn't get distracted and leave me stranded on some strange path. And then where would I be? Finally, after what felt like hours, I saw Grandmother's cottage. Exhausted and thirsty, I ran the rest of the way. I knocked excitedly at the door. Her voice welcomed me from within, barely a croak. She must have been in a much worse state than I thought. I felt extra terrible for the time I'd wasted with the wolf. Come in, my dear. Came her pained welcome, barely audible or even recognizable as her voice. Oh, Grandmother! Hello, I greeted, my heart aching for her health. Sunset was falling and the light had already grown dim. Grandmother had not yet risen to light a candle, so as I entered the cottage, I reached to light one for her. No! She barked quickly. The light hurts my eyes. Oh, Grandmother, I'm so sorry that I took so long. It was so unfair to you. I set down the basket, forgetting my own thirst and exhaustion. I stepped forward to hug her hello, but something in me stopped. What is it, my dear? Oh, pay no mind to your tardiness. Come give Granny a hug. Her face seemed wrong. At least, what I could see of her face, behind her glasses and the fading light... What was so wrong about it? Grandmother? Was your skin always so gray? Age and sickness, my dear. Uh, pay no mind. And were your eyes always so big? 
<laughs> All the better to see you with, my dear. She laughed, a harsh, croaking laughter. I laughed, too. My imagination was getting the better of me. I took a step closer. But your nose... Has it always been so big? The better to smell you with, my dear. Her voice had turned dark, and there, in the darkness, a flash. A smile I'd grown all too familiar with that day. I stepped back and he pounced, slamming me hard against the floor. Uh, uh, what big teeth you have! The better to eat you with, my dear. He snarled, <laughs> laughing as he opened his jaw wide to swallow me whole. There are certain moments that define who we are, that shape us, that destroy us. They make us in other ways. I realized the wolf had used me. Looking back on our conversations, I felt so stupid for telling him so much. He had seemed so nice, so affable, so considerate. Inside his belly, I felt things all around me. Strange and grotesque things I didn't want to think about. I especially didn't want to think what he'd done with Grandmother. I considered that perhaps if I'd gone with the wolf through his shortcut, he may have had his fill of just me and left Grandmother alone. It seemed a naive consideration in light of his apparent gluttony. I couldn't think of what he'd done to her, of how he might have used her before eating her, too. I hated myself for my naivete. I had destroyed us both. I played the day over in my mind a million times. I got angry. Why should one day ruin my life? Why should one greedy wolf end it? Why shouldn't I be allowed a few moments of childish delight in the world around me? I liked being able to talk to anyone I wished, to believe in goodness and trust the world around me. How could I now? I even liked how nice the wolf was when we first met. How could I have known his intentions? Why was he so nice? only to gobble me whole in the end. Most wolves don't bother with humans. Why me? Why grandmother? I was so, so angry. I still am to this day. I was balling up my fists inside my cloak, turning it about angrily until I had a thought. I undid the cloak and removed the pin that held it together, holding it tight between my fist. I grasped the pin tightly, and stabbed him hard from inside his soft organs, repeatedly, with all the rage the wolf had given me. I could hear him howling, hear his screams reverberate through his belly. I made myself nauseous from punching, stab after stab through him and felt white, hot fire coursing through my veins. Minutes passed as I continued to stab. At some point, I could no longer hear his cries. The slight press of his lungs against his stomach grew light, the sound faint. I only heard the sickening punch of my pin cutting through him. First, the inner linings of his stomach. And finally, the barrier of his outer skin was all that stopped me. I stabbed him harder, furious that he was already so close to death that he wouldn't be alive to feel my vengeance. 
I don't know how much time passed before I finally saw a pinprick of light poke through the ragged tissue of his insides. I dug my hands in, feeling the fresh air on my fingertips, and ripped his skin apart until finally there was room enough for my release. I fell heavily upon the straw floor of my grandmother's cottage, sticky with the blood and bile of the wolf. The air chilled me and bit at the parts of me he had started to digest. I sat and stared at his ruined carcass and threw myself at him, still not done with my punishment. With one final rage-filled scream, I fell back, staring at his body, malformed and bloody. And I sobbed. I wailed. But... By the dim light of the morning, I lived. Let the Old Wives Tell It is brought to you by Analogy Audio. This episode was written, directed, and guided by Christington Jean Plotkin. Additional voices include Vashta Youngworth as the narrator, Sarah Wheatley as Red, Ryan Warboss 5 Lay as the Wolf and David the Dressmaker. Aaron Lillis as Mother and Granny. Once Upon a Time voices include Christington, Cassandra Cherry, Josh Monroe from the City Within the Walls podcast, Eve Schleich, Ridge McKee, and Isaac Wisniewski. Analogy Audio is always casting for future projects and interested in adapting new stories for audio. Whether you're an actor, a writer, a musician, or a sound engineer, we'd love to get you involved. Analogy Audio is committed to inclusive casting choices. For more information, go to analogyaudio.com or shoot us a message over social media. Little Red Riding Hood and The Barring of the Door were performed by Christington. Little Red Riding Hood, the song, was written by Ron Blackwell. Additional music provided by Epidemic Sound. For a full list of songs, check out the episode notes or go to our website. Some sound effects were provided by freesound.org. Thank you so much to our pre-readers and pre-listeners, Eric Lucian Vallone, Liz Brooks, Simon Hedrick, Cody Sarvis, Andrea Marie, Adam Johnson, Sharice, Sarah Duvall, and Melissa Rose Taylor. We really appreciate you guys. Once again, thank you everyone for listening, and we hope to see you around the campfire next month as we explore Cinderella.